The Netherlands Innovation Network stimulates R&D collaboration between Singapore and the Netherlands. We provide information on the latest technology trends and developments and connect you with leading research institutes and companies. The Netherlands Innovation Network is the partner for your international R&D ambitions. We have a strong connecting role in the local and regional tech ecosystem and the Dutch tech networks. We proactively maintain relationships with the most relevant investors and entrepreneurial networks. We are here to connect startups and scale-ups with possible partners and assist them in their growth and international expansion. Our aim is to strengthen the position of the Dutch agricultural ecosystem in Singapore, providing valuable insights on Singapore's 30 by 30 journey, promoting collaboration in sustainable agriculture so that we can produce more food with less land, water and energy using circular food systems. Hi, my name is Adria Verbeek, co-founder of ATOP World's Greenest Packaging. First of all, I would like to thank IPI and the Dutch Embassy for this great opportunity. I'll start with a short introduction. Who are we and what do we do? And then I will present five innovations that might, uh, might uh, interest you uh, but I can assure you there is more. Our team consists of four people and we have over 100 years of experience in the packaging world. Of key importance to know is that we develop new pack packaging and technologies, know-how and intellectual property is licensed. So we do not produce ourselves. We're always looking for partners who are uh, willing to take um, the uh, know-how and the intellectual uh, property. We develop both generic and custom-made packaging solutions for food, for drinks, and non-food. We have knowledge of recycling and we make our own LCAs. And that's quite important to know because that uh, by that way, we can objectivate um, the current and the new innovative uh, packaging. We are experts in many materials, in printing technology and film extrusion. So we do not have in-depth knowledge of tin and glass. Big advantage is that we operate independently. We are not tied to a choice of materials. I'm now going to show you and share with you a couple of um, examples um, out of the five se segments I selected. It's fruit and vegetables, snack vegetables. You see one uh, on the left, uh, and I can show you uh, uh, one over here. It combines fun and functionality for snack food. And then uh, we have a special um, packaging developed uh, for uh, soft fruit, but now uh, in recycled uh, carton, carton that is food approved, hygienic, um, resistant to moisture, and that is shock and moisture absorbing. Uh, since we developed a special uh, bottom uh, for it. And then uh, a packaging for strawberries. Examples for to-go and home delivery to replace uh, single-use plastics. Um, it's a unique uh, packaging. 
it's uh, leak free. We have a packaging for uh, drinks. Uh, and coming soon is a replacement for um, a pizza uh, box, but without uh, any PFAS. Then we have the easy steam. Um, this is to steam um, your um, meal or meal com components in the microwave. But this um, innovation, you keep the quality, flavor, and nutritional value. And then uh, last but not least, uh, a rim rolled uh, plastic uh, tray. It's all about maintaining quality and reducing weight. Why? One of the main objectives is to search for innovations that reduce the use of plastic. From the plastic cups, we know the nicely curled rim, which is called the rim roll. The rim roll can now also be formed on non-round products. And that is the innovation. And it can be done in mold in just one step. And that has a great advantage. Now, all kinds of shapes are possible. Um, and it is a patented um, innovation. Suitable for all kinds of materials. Um, suitable for thermoforming. Sealable. Uh, can be closed and reclosed with a lid. And it is a patented packaging innovation. Thanks very much. And hope to see you soon. Hello, I'm Jack Poole. I'm the CEO of Big Mile. And Big Mile is a CO2 uh, um, footprint optimization platform, and we call ourselves the standard in CO2 footprint optimization. We uh, basically offer you um, a, a back end and a, and a front end uh, um, tool, and the, the back end uh, helps you to, to upload your data and to, to validate your data. Um, and to prepare your data analysis and the front end basically shows the outcomes uh, with CO2 uh, calculations at the lowest level of detail, which is the shipment, but also on a management level, a management summary. So what do we offer you? We have a CO2 reporting at management summary and, deep, and shipment detailed level. We have uh, CO2 accounting. So we help you to prepare yourselves in the, for the world there where CO2 will be priced. Uh, in the total logistics chain, and it helps you to, to invoice, uh, for instance, CO2 pricing at the lowest level of detail to your clients, but also to, to, uh, to report it to, for instance, governmental organizations. We have multiple analysis uh, functionalities, uh, which help you to, um, to see where you can become better, um, how you, your customers compare with each other, uh, you can compare your subcontractors, um, and we offer you a scenario functionality um, and the scenario functionality is very, very strong, helping you to validate whether uh, improvements in modalities can be made. So, for instance, to move from air to sea, and you immediately see what the impact is. It's on the spot uh, in a second. Uh, but it also shows, for instance, if you move, uh, if you change your fuel types from diesel to biodiesel or to electrical vehicles, what is the impact right away? So all in all, we offer you a lot of, 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 of opportunities to really optimize your CO2 footprint. Why do we believe we are the standards? Um, we are built around the, the EN 16258 method, the, commonly known as the standard at the moment. Um, and we use that to calculate and to allocate our CO2. Um, we follow uh, multiple uh, key figures like the, the GLAC, uh, the French degree, CO2 emissions factors, the UK emission factors, and we are uh, con continuously uh, expanding that list of, of methodologies to, to really support our, our clients globally. We're also working on a certified accountancy statement, um, which helps you to, uh, to overcome uh, highly costs on, on accountants, so that you can have an official statement that the report, uh, the reporting done with Big Mail is the right one, is okay. And we are rapidly growing at the moment. Uh, so already have, have 200 users um, that use our platform uh, on, on a frequent basis. There are either shippers, there are carriers, there are governmental organizations. Um, and uh, we also have a European partner program with the Lean and Green uh, program. 
And uh, our expansion is uh, taking place out of the Netherlands, where we have our headquarters. Um, we have about uh, 12 people uh, working on product development uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and some sales. And we also have a recently established sales office in Germany. And that's the, the start of our global expansion. Uh, and will, more sales offices will be opened in the near future. Um, at the moment, already our products can support the whole, whole global supply chain. Uh, all, um, all countries, all, uh, all networks are included. All modalities are included. So you could already start right away. And we are going to support you globally. Um, that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attendance and um, looking forward to, to meet you share, you, share a demo with you and uh, see how we could cooperate. Thank you. Incinerator bottom ash processing, an innovative way to process ash to convert it into a usable aggregate as new sand. I'm Rogier van der Weijer, International Business Development Manager at Blue Phoenix Group. In our daily life, we throw away stuff that's then collected and sorted by professional companies. However, we have to bear in mind that there's a non-recyclable portion that's going to the energy from waste facility. And although then the energy is reclaimed, there is an unburnable portion, which is incinerator bottom ash. We as Blue Phoenix Group give that ash a new life. We sort the metals, which can then be used to produce new cars, mobile phones, computers, and we recycle the aggregates to become a new sand for using concrete products and in road construction. That's the, the value chain of our company. We operate on a global scale. We have operations in Europe, United Kingdom, the United States, in Asia, and recently have started in Australia. We build, own, and operate on a global scale these IBA facilities. Um, to date, we process about four and a half million tons of that material, which is the equivalent of about 15, 16 million tons of waste. And apart from the IBA processing within our group, we also have some metals refinery business to further upgrade scrap metals into a high quality product that can be sold to the metal smelter industries. If you take a closer look at IBA, it consists of unburnable materials, mainly metals, uh, ferrous metals, non-ferrous metals. However, the vast majority consists of sand, glass, stone, ceramics, a mineral fraction. To date, all that material is going to landfill in, at the Semakau landfill. And our innovative technology can assure that this is converted into new sand as an aggregate for construction. Blue Phoenix Group has always been front running these technologies. We have been developing patented technologies a ballistic separation technology, which is currently in use at the TUAS ash recycling facility. The next step would be IBA washing, a technology developed in the Netherlands to comply with strict regulations and to assure the use of this product in a country with a high water table, with the use of aquifers for drinking water, dense population, and a shortage of land. The wet technology has integrated metal sorting to further improve fine metal recovery and structurally removes the contaminants, the soluble contaminants, to make sure there's an end of waste aggregate remaining. As Blue Phoenix Group, we actually have been uh, invited by NEA to do a trial run and we have shipped materials to Singapore uh, and it has been tested now in the Tanamera Coast Road, and it has been used for the production of concrete products. In the next film, we show you um, how this technology works in the Netherlands and how this, the future of IBA processing could look like in Singapore. At Blue Phoenix Group, we don't see landfills as the final destination for residue ash. We see new beginnings. We see materials to build roads and construct new cars. Driven by new environmental legislation expressed in the Dutch Green Deal, we have developed an innovative method to wash incinerator bottom ash. The large-scale facility in the Netherlands is designed, built and operated by Blue Phoenix Group.
contaminants are structurally removed in various intense washing steps. Washing the ash also unlocks optimal recovery of valuable metals. Washing enables the recovery of very fine metal particles. The water treatment is a closed loop system, cleaning the water with zero liquid discharge. The contaminants removed in the process are concentrated into a small sludge cake fraction suitable for landfilling. Skilled operators supported by automated controls ensure a high uptime of the installation and guarantees a reliable product quality. The cleaned aggregates are now ready to replace virgin materials in infrastructural works and concrete products. We are Blue Phoenix Group, building a sustainable future. So thank you for watching, thank you for the attention and be um, awaiting your questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is George Steins. I'm the founder and CEO of ChannelEngine.com, a software service platform that connects brands, wholesalers, and retailers to marketplaces and other sales channels on a global scale. Our company was founded in 2013 uh, out of necessity uh, because of our own e-commerce platform that needs to connect to any sales channel. In the meantime, we have over 100 marketplace professionals in our team. Uh, five offices worldwide, and we uh, provide 24-7 support. E-commerce is changing a lot. Um, it's growing enormously, uh, especially during COVID last year. It has been increasing. To We expect it to be 4.9 trillion US dollars in 2023, and that's only 15 to 20% of all of retail. Uh, and that shift is going faster and faster. Uh, a lot of e-commerce is shifting towards marketplaces. So uh, in Asia, uh, Shopee, Lazada, but of course globally, Amazon, Walmart, and those kind of platforms are, are, are gaining traction. And we expect that more than 75% of e-commerce sales will go through a marketplace or dropshipping model. That adds a lot of complexity for retailers and brands that want to utilize that. New marketplaces are being added every week. Uh, small niche marketplaces, but also bigger marketplaces are expanding globally. And that adds complexity for sellers. So if you want to sell multiple platforms at the same time, you need to update the listings, need to connect to your backend systems. And it's getting more and more complex. Uh, it's essential for brands to, to synchronize all the content, product information, prices, top levels, orders, etc. Uh, and that's, that can be a hard job, especially if you have many channels to, to manage. Our solution, Channel Engine, is a software as a service platform together with a large partner ecosystem, which can help you sell globally across all these different platforms. As a result, if you're using our solution, uh, you've got a platform uh, as well as partners that can help you with a faster time to market, full control of product availability, delivery and pricing, centralized control of global sales, uh, and rapidly growing e-commerce sales uh, with less people. Uh, and in the end, they will be helping you maximizing profit uh, and data-driven insights and automation. I just spoke about our network. Uh, if you want to sell cross-border, uh, it's not on your software solution, but you might need someone to help with uh, optimizing your content, making sure your products are found on the different marketplaces. So we've got a network of more than 65 e-commerce agencies uh, that can help you out. Uh, we've got a large network of partners that can help you connect your backend systems to Channel Engine, which makes it uh, open to basically any marketplace globally. And on top of that, we provide a large network of fulfillment providers that can stock your products, uh, are pre-connected to Channel Engine, and then that way you can easily sell uh, in Southeast Asia, Australia, US, Canada, uh, Europe, and even Russia. 
And then there's a whole host of technology providers uh, providing additional services uh, to, to help you maximize their sales. So if you're interested in Channel Engine, um, you can connect um, to our team, uh, ask for a demo, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, do a great collaboration. Uh, and if you're a brand, wholesaler, or retailer, we can help you connect to any sales channels on a global scale. Thanks for your attention. Hi, my name is Linda Dijkshorn. I'm one of the founders and CEO of EV Biotech. And I'd like to talk to you about the future of chemistry because we believe it's in fermentation and data science. Imagine a world where we could adapt biology to manufacture any product sustainably at speed and on demand. It would allow us to create a world in which we can eradicate the physical burdens of production placed on disadvantaged people, but also on our environment and planet. Because we all know that at this moment in time, many manufacturing processes and procedures are fouling and uh, plain disruptive to ecology and people. So we believe that the future of uh, uh, chemical production is actually cellular. cellular. These little organisms that you see in the middle of the screen are our tiny heroes, and we can actually engineer them to be able to produce a lot of chemical compounds effectively and sustainably. And this is not just for the pharma industry, for example. They can, be, they can produce lubricants, flavors, fragrances, materials even, uh, as well as pharmaceutical. And we could replace uh, fouling uh, petrochemical processes with these natural fermentation processes that are carbon neutral. So the impact on uh, economies that we could have is exponential. If you look at the sizes of the different markets where we could replace uh, uh, fouling processes, it's, it's the health and performance markets alone is $1.2 trillion, as well as agriculture consumer products and services and materials uh, uh, and energy production, we can make a huge impact with this technology. So synthetic biology, the engineering of microbes to become uh, molecular cell factories can be an incredibly disruptive uh, um, technology to be able to change multiple industries and make them sustainable. Now, Currently, uh, when, when micro, microbial cell factories are engineered, it is a slow and costly process. The R&D time usually uh, has an average of five to 10 years before a process is even put in an industrial uh, um, uh, setting. It's very costly and it's very wasteful because people are using trial and error practices. Um, well, we figured we need to find a solution for this. So we're actually fusing technology and biology from start to finish. We start actually by modeling and calculating the potential effectiveness of such a strain um, right off the bat before we even go into the laboratory. Now, this allows us to actually nip unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessful pr uh, projects in the bud, but also to select uh, of the thousands of var uh, variable strategies that you could take, uh, only the top 10 best ones. So it saves an incredible amount of work in the laboratory. So that makes us unrivaledly efficient. It lowers risk in our R&D process, and it, it generates optimal results for effective production methods for these high value chemicals. So it's faster, cheaper, and better. We can do the development in half of the time. It will cost about half of the development price because you know, we only use half of the R&D hours and the performance of our strains are usually superior. Because we uh, do a lot of our experiments in silico in the computer, we uh, create a lot less plastic waste and energy consumption. So we optimize across all three core development processes. We start by calculating a feasibility, but we we use our computational tools all, th all throughout the whole process and even calculate how to upskill best. So this is our EV pipeline. It's our proprietary process with a lot of our own algorithms and pieces of software that will make sure 
that within in, in a very short time span we will be able to generate production processes for ourselves but also for our clients so we can do this for you we would be able to actually give you a scoping or a feasibility study to see what the value and the potential success rate of this project would be we dissolve the risk factor in just 10 weeks so within 10 weeks we can tell you what the risk factor is of your project so if you're interested you know uh, take it uh, get in touch with me and uh, yeah, I want to leave you with this last quote. Thank you for your attention. Good day to you all. My name is uh, Jan Willem Rowell. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Flexbase. Um, I like to introduce my company to you. And for that reason, I've made a small overview what we are doing. Uh, our mission statement is uh, living with water instead of fighting the water. We are uh, developing and designing large scale floating uh, platforms uh, that we can use for several uh, possibilities like uh, living, working, but also for leisure. Uh, our company was uh, founded in 2013, but already a few years before we started to develop this uh, floating construction with some major companies in Holland. Uh, but lately uh, we have been doing altogether 6,000 square meters of floating constructions and that happened to be in, in Holland but also in Asia, Bangladesh, Philippines and the Middle East. And this year we also founded Flexbase International in Singapore we have there a uh, co-founder that is a CEO, that is uh, Shivan Yap. And uh, from there, we have a hub to uh, promote uh, Flexbase in the Asian region. Uh, it has several patterns, this construction. And one of the features is that I am uh, producing that straight on the water and it needs minimal maintenance. So the latest IPC report uh, noticed that we have a real big issue. And the issue is sea level rise. And for that is uh, the Global Center of Adaptation in, uh, in Holland, uh, with its headquarters in Holland, together with some other big uh, worldwide uh, foundations are uh, working now on city adaptation. So uh, we are not dealing only with sea level rise uh, due to climate change, but we also dealing with uh, land subsidence. For instance, if you look to Jakarta, Jakarta is sinking about 15 centimeters a year. On the other hand, we are also dealing with land scarcity that, uh, because a lot of people are moving to the big cities and the big cities are most of the time always near shore. So, our solution is then working on adaptation. So our solution and secrets are in fact, uh, that we are building directly on water already stated before. As you see the picture on the, uh, on the right, there you see that we have, uh, yeah, let's say pieces of uh, APS that we put on the water. And it, the concept is like a surfboard. We have three different types of structures that we build on the water. The major items are high buoyancy uh, and it is all recyclable. So our business model is uh, that we are first looking into feasibility. If it is possible to build a floating structure on the location, then we design a floating foundation. Uh, in that respect, we are looking into all aspects like waves and the water depths, etc. cetera. Uh, we build it and we do that with always with local uh, partners. Uh, we uh, give out licenses, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the next step will be that we're also looking into finance the floats that we can then uh, use to, for instance, uh, fish farming and agriculture uh, farming on the water. And uh, our uh, final, uh, yeah, let's say, round in the, uh, in the business model is then that we are talking about operate and maintain our structures. Our target markets are uh, hospitality and leisure. Uh, we talk about uh, food security, 
Uh, then we're talking about fish farming and agriculture. Energy, for instance, is also one of our targets. And one of the latest ones is that we talk about floating data centers. So what we really are looking for are partners to implement this kind of concept in Singapore, but mainly in the whole Asian region. So if you have any questions, please contact me and we can have a discussion about uh, what we can do in the coming future to, uh, let's say, adapt our world to the sea level rise and land uh, subsidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey everyone, thank you for listening into this uh, presentation. My name is Alexander Entover. I'm head of business development at CRIA. And in this presentation, I'll explain you more about a landmark project that we're currently developing with our valued industry partners. But before doing so, let me briefly introduce our company, CRIA. CRIA is a uh, product development studio in the Netherlands and Singapore that solves complex multi stakeholder problems through blockchain technology with a strong focus on digital sustainability and process optimization. And we do so by means of design and development of the product itself and the ecosystem around it to make a solution flourish. Um, so let's dive deeper into an example to make this more tangible. Unfortunately, we are confronted with pictures like these a little too often. Uh, plastic waste ending up in landfills or in the ocean. Um, in Southeast Asia, only 9% of all plastic is recycled, while 79% uh, head straight to landfills. This means that waste is currently heavily mismanaged in a lot of countries. And of course, we all play an important role in this problem. And trends show that possible consumer goods companies are getting pushed to do something about this. So a push mechanism that is getting more popular is the extended producer responsibility uh, policies or EPR policies. And simply put, these policies are holding corporations accountable for a percentage of it, often um, in the form of packaging material that they put into the system. But the key issue here is that there's too little waste management capacity to actually comply to the regulations, meaning that goals set for sorting and recycling can't be met with the current infrastructure. Let's take India as an example. Um, currently, um, plastic recycling percentages in India are hovering around 5%, while EPR targets are set above 30%. And regulations adopted already to reach 90% of recycling within five years. So the, for brand owners, there are two options to comply to the regulations. Either demonstrate that you recycle the required percentage of plastic waste stated in the yard regulations or um, buying costly plastic credits to offset your production. So how can you actually comply to the regulations at low cost instead of these two options? Well, in collaboration with industry partners, we have created ResiChain, a blockchain technology-based platform that facilitates investments in waste management capacity to improve the lives of waste pickers and create a positive environmental impact. So by investing in future waste management infrastructure, organizations can comply to EPR regulations at low cost. So they don't, don't, don't have to invest in costly plastic credits anymore. And in fact, investing in additionality uh, means that they can actually get plastic credits for these pets. And in return, they can sell other uh, sell these to other organizations to comply. So um, let's take a look at how this actually works. On the platform, enablers, often in the form of NGOs, create programs with projects. And these projects can represent the construction or improvement of a sorting unit for plastic waste. The brand owner can then uh, scan the platform for suitable programs and diversify their portfolio based on multiple criteria that they set themselves. Uh, and once they found a suitable program that they want to invest in, they can uh, invest and get inactivated credits in return. So as, as soon as the investment threshold is reached and the enabler starts the construction of this sorting unit, um, then um, if it's operationalized, the sorting unit uploads proof of the fact that they are operational by selling the sorted waste um, to recyclers and then uploading the invoice onto the platform. The recycler then verifies the claim of the sorting unit by checking the actual physical amounts with the um, with the claim of the uh, sorting unit. And at the moment of verification or after verification, the material is made traceable and the inactive credits that the brand owner received are now activated, meaning that the investment in additional waste management capacity is now successful. Um, with these credits, they can um, report 
to um, EPR compliance and also sell excess plastic credits. So if they have more than, than needed, they can sell them to other organizations, giving a very lucrative business model. So on the investment, uh, once it is effective and the sorting units are operational, it's not only beneficial for the environment and the people working in the informal sector, it's also a very attractive return on investment for the brand owners and their suppliers itself. So calculated with an average price of $500 per plastic credit, you can expect a 10x return on investment with an annual return of 30% over five year period, which is the average period of, of uh, uh, return. So did you get excited and eager to do something about this global plastic waste problem while also taking into account the financial sustainability of your organization? Um, we are looking for organizations that want to scale this initiative with us. So please re reach out to us if this interests you and uh, we're happy to explore collaborations with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon and welcome to our presentation of our GDPR proof and fraud resistant access control system uh, made for you by Ledger Leopard, uh, also called our self sovereign identity solution. And before I'm going to go into the solution itself, let me briefly introduce our company. Ledger Leopard is an Amsterdam based technology company, which is really a front runner in new technology state of the art tech and especially within blockchain. We are by far the biggest uh, producer of blockchain solutions in uh, the Netherlands and maybe even in the Benelux. We have a team of over 50 people working constantly on creating new technological solutions um, and uh, not only creating them from a uh, point of view that we come up with solutions, thinking about that for our clients, but also actually building them and putting them into implementation phases. So not only demos or uh, uh, minimum viable products, but really production ready systems. So we truly help you realize the future. So realize what the future can entail and realize it for you. So let me deep dive a little bit more into our um, SSI or self-sovereign identity solution. And especially what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, nowadays with access control, in both the physical and in the digital world, we do see that this process can be very time consuming with a lot of manual checks of credentials. Does the person that wants to enter this building or wants to enter this program have the right credentials to do so? Do they have the right diplomas? Do they have the right, um, did they do the right courses to do so? And with these credentials, are they the right credentials and are they true credentials issued by a trustworthy party or is it a credential that they have produced themselves? And especially with physical access control, we do see that we need a lot of specific hardware to be installed for granting access and also employees in a lot of cases have the power to reproduce or manipulate these uh, credentials because we do see more and more, unfortunately, fraud cases with regards to certain credentials. Besides that, we also see the element of um, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of databases get hacked. So a lot of personal sensitive information is being lost. And especially and most forwardly is persons who the data is about are no longer in control of their data. Once you hand over your data, you can't control if they will share with somebody else, yes or no. And this is really what the world of a self sovereign identity um, uh, solves. So we give you careful, uh, careful and uh, fast access controls based on uh, true credentials that are uh, there with mathematical uh, certainty to make sure that the credentials that are presented are true. We have data minimization and the person in itself is fully in control in whom I do want to share the data with and do I want to retract this sharing of data. So make sure that your GDPR proof and that the person verifying the credentials knows for sure that this person really, really um, has this credential in itself. So how does it work in general? Well, you have a trusted issuer, a person or party who says this is a true credential and that is sent to the holder. And the holder is the person in itself who can hold this credential in their wallet on their telephone. 
and present this to a verifier. And this is where the technology then comes in. The verifier can scan this credential and using blockchain technology can verify if the presented uh, credential was a true credential and not a falsified or a copied from a friend, yes or no. And let me make it perfectly clear, we use this blockchain system for verification of the credentials, but we do not store any personal data on the ledgering itself. So just let me give you an example process. For example, there is a, a laboratory that checks on COVID results. Well, these COVID results will be sent to your wallet on your telephone. And within the wallet in the telephone, you can transfer this into a QR code. This QR code can then be scanned by the verifying party. And a verifying party then either gets a green screen stating this person adheres to the um, COVID credentials that we think, uh, think is fit to enter, or you get a red cross stating uh, this person is not allowed to come in. And a picture paints uh, a thousand words, and this is what things then look like in real life. So you scan the QR code, and then you either pop up a green screen stating, yes, this, is a, this person is allowed to come in with a picture of the person in itself, uh, so you know for sure that this credential uh, at, uh, belongs to the person presenting it, or either a red cross stating, this person is not, not allowed to come in here. Well. I want to tell you much more about our solution and how it works in practice. And you can use it basically in any type of industry with any type of credential, but please contact us then during um, uh, the tech innovation uh, days and we'll tell you much more about how this solution will work. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Jonathan. I'm lead automation at Moza Meat, where we are pioneering a cleaner and kinder way of making real beef. If you look at the history of some of our biggest industries, communication, transportation, agriculture, you see that we've been relying on animals for a very long time. Fast forwarding to today, we have replaced these animals with devices and machines, making process much quicker and more, um, more reliable. But not only that, by taking out the animal and replacing it with technology, we could start thinking bigger and building stuff that were unimaginable before. If you look at this trend, you would say that by now, all industries would have gotten rid of the animal and replaced it with uh, machines. Unfortunately, this is not the case. One of our biggest industries, the meat industry, is still heavily relying on animals. We're consuming and producing loads amount of, of meat every day. And we're plan it seems like we're uh, doing this so in the future as well. This is causing issues all around the globe. Uh, the meat industry is responsible for a large part of our greenhouse gas emissions. It's responsible for the majority of our agriculture land use, causing deforestation. We're using a lot of fresh water and most of our antibiotics are going into the animals. But on top of that, there is the sad situation that we're just killing millions and millions of animals every single day. Luckily, there are alternatives, and we are working on one of them. Back in 2013, Professor Mark Post and co-founder of Mosameet uh, presented the world the first ever hamburger grown inside of a lab. The process is quite complex, but I would like to explain it in, four, in the four basic steps. First of all, we go to the animal. We take a small sample, which we bring to our facilities and we select the cells that we start with. Those cells we put into an, um, a device, which we call a um, cultivator, and fill that device with a liquid medium full of nutrients, vitamins, and creating this comfy climate where they can start to proliferate. This means that every 24 hours, they will double in numbers. Once we have enough cells, we bring them into a hydrogel where they can fuse together into muscle fibers. And in a parallel process, we uh, let the cells grow, other types of cells grow into fat or adipose tissue. Once those two products are ready, we bring them together and form a nice juicy hamburger. At Mosameet, the majority of the people working with us are either scientists or engineers. 
And we're developing technologies all across this pro uh, production process. We have developed methods and equipment for harvesting and selecting the ideal starting cells. We have developed uh, different kinds of media, both for cell growth, muscle formation, and for fat formation, which are complete food safe and animal free. We also develop biomaterials that support the cells, both for muscle formation and for fat formation. And besides that, we also have a dedicated team of engineers uh, developing production equipment that are not available on the market, including a harvesting station, muscle tissue cultivators, and fat tissue cultivators. With that, I would like to invite you to talk uh, with us. Uh, we're a very international team and internationally focused. We're eager to work with people within the meat industry as well as outside of the meat industry. Think of biotech, chemical and food processing, but also robotics, packaging and branding. Uh, we're exploring the options of licensing our technologies. So please visit our booth and let's have a conversation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emmanuel from OneWord. We are a company building an industrial AI to listen and understand machines for industrial maintenance and for process and condition monitoring. Machines such as motors are very important to industry. In fact, majority of their power consumption is used just to run these motors. However, this reliance puts them at risk as in heavy motor use industries such as uh, pulp and mining, one in eight of their motors are expected to fail every year. And when they fail, they can cost very expensive downtimes up to $180,000 per hour, not to mention other issues such as safety and health concerns. So with motors being this important, we thought that they deserved more attention. So we listened to them. Inspired by the techniques employed by veteran workers in facilities, wherein through experience and familiarity with their machines, they know if something is wrong by just listening. So we built our system to literally listen to the problems of machines using AI and IoT sensors. We, we created our sensors, we call ears, to listen to the machines and our core AI, Sense A, to make sense of the noise. Because it is relying on sound, it removes the usual hurdles that come with implementing condition monitoring in industries. It is non-invasive. To install, first, you just get the sensors. Second, you attach it anywhere near the asset that you want monitored. And third, that's it. So unlike other systems, there's no need to cut wires, no need to shut down, adjust your processes, or have any dangers in your existing warranties, making installation and usage virtually risk-free. It is also adaptive. So while it is pre-trained to uh, detect motor faults that uh, other systems also promise, like bearing faults and race defects, it goes beyond it. So uh, as facilities vary from one to the next, uh, our solution doesn't take a one-size-fits-all solution. It even flags anomalies or process events that may be very niche to your facility or industry that normally may require additional sensors or additional processes to address. And thirdly, because it uses AI, it is also predictive. One of the benefits of digitization, IoT, and AI is that your expert is now live 24-7, always learning and improving, never getting tired, and always alert for developing issues, alerting you before they become problems for your facility, allowing for predictive maintenance. This leads to a more efficient usage of your motors, extended asset lifetimes, and reduced unplanned downtimes. So in the past years, with our partners and collaborators, we have developed our system from the ground up and installed it itself in the field in several industries. Because of this, we were also able to learn and develop specialized stacks of the system that addresses additional specific issues in industries in addition to uh, fault detection. Uh, also, right now, we are working directly with OEMs and sensor manufacturers to integrate our AI directly into their hardwares in order to, to further make uh, industrial AI and condition monitoring more accessible to the majority of the facilities. Right now, we are getting ready to go to market with our solution. In order to do this, we need more partners that we can work with to co-create uh, domain-specific builds 
of our AI. We also need service providers and OEMs we can work with to go to market and integrate our solution directly into their offerings. And lastly, we're opening a round of funding to build our commercial and support capabilities and also manufacturing our devices to industry compliance. So if you're interested to learn more and hear from us, please do have a chat with us. We'd love to listen. Thank you. Opticwell's event lab system supports drinking water company in making their water distribution safer. My name is Jos Verhoef, I'm Managing Director at Opticwell. Opticwell offers with our event lab system a complete solution for real-time water quality monitoring. We are a specialist in water quality monitoring and especially event alerting. And for that reason, we called our product Event Lab. For many years, we have a cooperation with the National Water Agency of Singapore, PUB. And we are part of the Demcon Group in the Netherlands with research and production facilities and a subsidiary in Singapore. Over the years, we have seen a need for real-time monitoring throughout the complete drinking water chain. And the main reason is the risk of losing water consumers' trust due to an incident. Of course, drinking water companies monitor the water carefully, but still, in many countries, the distribution networks are a weak link. Especially, the response on incidents is often too little, too late. And sampling is not able to resolve events as they are happening. And with a sample sampling procedure, it is very difficult to identify the contamination source. And last but not least, traditional online-based monitoring solutions miss most contaminations. So it's our vision to secure water safety, you need to know events as they happen. And for this, new monitoring tools are required. Monitoring tools which are real-time and continuous, again, which are able to localize the source of the contamination, have a central dashboard, and of course, are cost-effective and low-maintenance. With our system Event Lab, we are able to monitor change in the water matrix as a generic indicator of water quality. So we monitor deviations in the water quality and we, we um, uh, supply a baseline to our clients which reflects the normal water profile. And once the water quality exceeds normal variations, we raise a red flag. In this presentation, I will not go into the technical details of our, of our products. But please remember that the, uh, the core of our technology, our optical sensor, is the fact that we, we detect very small changes in the refractive index of water. And the beauty of this concept is that any contaminant dissolved in drinking water has a direct impact on the refractive index of water, enabling us to monitor a full spectrum of chemical contaminants with just one single sensor. Optica offers a complete solution for real-time water quality monitoring. So not only our patented sensor, but also the data transmission infrastructure. Over the years, we have developed a set of our own proprietary algorithms, and we make this available in our detection software. We have a web portal, and we added a sample preservator and auto sampler to the solution. We take care of the total solution meaning the system design, the installation, and also we can take care of the maintenance. As said, we have uh, been working closely together with the National Water Edge CPUB of Singapore. And with them, we were able to develop the solution for real-time water quality monitoring and water security. It all started with a proof of principle, and now we are ready for a full rollout island wide in Singapore. The system we have can be deployed at all critical nodes in water production and distribution, meaning production plants, reservoirs, pump, station, pump stations, main distribution pipes, and also intake monitoring for critical infrastructure. We have clients in Europe and in Asia, 
And we are very open for partnerships, commercial partnerships for further rollouts, especially in Asia. Please contact us at info at optica.com for further information about our products and perhaps a potential collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, good afternoon. This is Jeevan Shifley. I work for Royal Haskerning DHV, and I want to share this uh, fascinating technology that we have designed for you. So our company is almost 40 years in business this year, and we design business processes like supply chains, passenger flows, traffic flows, and we design physical infrastructure, ports, airports, bridges, uh, railways, anything. And we assess all of them on their impact on the environment or the other way around, how the environment has an impact on the assets and processes, uh, be it climate change, be it weather, whatever. And for 140 years, by making clients more resilient to all these uh, natural hazards, we've been able to keep them in business. So that's the company. Now, what's the problem? Um, as you all know, climate change, uh, the weather is becoming, becoming more extreme. But there's other stuff going on, like economical uh, uh, pressures. Uh, we have over-optimized supply chains, um, just-in-time deliveries. Um, we see trade wars. We see social unrest, people who don't have a very economic uh, welfare life, and uh, they want to get uh, to the rich countries. So what we're seeing is that more and more hazards have an, uh, is, uh, are disrupting the, uh, the business processes. And as business processes are so over-optimized, smaller events have a larger impact. And the third one, anywhere in the world, something can happen and it can ripple to uh, different industries, different countries, as we've all seen with, uh, with COVID. So that hits companies in many different aspects, the risk management part, procurement, business continuity, supply chains. And in the end, that leads to lost revenues, higher costs, reputation damage, and also missed opportunities. So what, what have we done? We've created an hazard agnostic platform based on uh, data available, either publicly or from science institutes or from uh, commercial providers. We've connected that and we are able to make transparent for any location in the world at any moment what happened in the past, what's happening now, and what will happen over the next few hours, days, and decades. And we've combined that with our 140 years experience of uh, engineering and understanding how these assets are vulnerable to all these changes. So what can you do with that? So we are able to tell you that a beer brewery won't have um, groundwater available anymore 12 years from now in a certain part of the world. We're able to tell what port is experiencing storm over the next few days, which will lead to days of uh, delays for the, for the cargo. We're able to tell you what airports will be exposed to increased heat and uh, who might take an impact on their flight operations because of the, the, the warm air. And <clears throat> we can tell you anywhere in the world what asset, what location is exposed to what uh, natural hazards uh, yours, maybe your suppliers, or maybe even your customers or your competitors. So what's different? All the existing approaches are either domain specific, so they're applied in finance or in supply chains or compliance. They're expensive because they mostly depend on people and they're very difficult to use by non-experts. And we came up with a multi-purpose uh, platform that can be used by anybody in a company with a very comfortable pricing structure. And the focus that we have is about making businesses uh, resilient instead of just uh, uh, identifying the risk. So we call it uptime compared to not having downtime. What we're looking for is um, uh, we just closed the first uh, initial engagements with uh, launching customers. We're looking for more uh, testbed opportunities. We're looking for partners who have complementary data. We can't do all the hazards in the world that are out there. Um, so this is really a partner play. And we're looking for investments and uh, licensing agreements and uh, co-development of the platform. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
Hi everyone, my name is Simon Jaags and one of the founders of Samotics. At Samotics, we provide our clients with a solution to prevent unplanned downtime and to optimize energy consumption for industrial electric motors and rotating equipment such as pumps, fans and conveyors. Founded in 2015, we're now a team of over 60 people serving clients across the globe. And our clients are active in a diversity of industries, operating pumps, fans, conveyors, really as the backbone of what they do. But because there's so many of them, and because they also fail quite a bit, depending on your industry and application, between 5 and 15%, this is a hugely expensive problem. Now, because of the cost of that problem, many of our clients are shifting from a reactive and a plant maintenance strategy that accepts downtime as a byproduct of their maintenance strategy to a more sophisticated regimen. Think of condition-based, predictive or prescriptive maintenance. And if you want to shift to a, to a more uh, data-driven maintenance approach, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to install a condition monitoring system. Now, there's many types of those available. Uh, all of them have a source of data. Uh, they have analytics to turn that data into information, which is then presented to maintenance engineers um, to optimize their maintenance uh, frequency. Um, and that's what we do as well. But what makes it unique is that we analyze electrical waveforms. And we do that with a system called SAMP4, our fourth generation smart asset monitor. Um, the system itself consists of a set of sensors and communication hardware. They measure current and voltage data, send it to the cloud for an analysis where we turn that data into information about the condition, the performance, and the energy consumption of connected assets. So when we then detect a failure, you will receive an alert so that you can effectively schedule inspections, repairs, or replacements well before your assets fail. Now, the system is based on the principle that both electrical and mechanical failures across a drivetrain, for instance, anywhere here on this pump setup where you have a variable speed drive, you have a motor and a pump itself, any failure will result in a deviation or a change in the, in the electrical waveforms. So by installing sensors inside the motor control cabinet and measuring those waveforms with a very high frequency, we can observe those changes and turn them into information about the asset health, but also about asset performance, an energy monitor and operational metrics. And collectively, this helps our clients to reduce unplanned downtime and reduce energy waste in a cost-effective manner. Now, um, the benefits of such a system are fairly obvious. Number one, because sensors are installed inside the motor control cabinet, it is quite easy to monitor assets that operate in very harsh conditions. Think of very hot and very cold temperatures, but also think, for instance, of submerged pumps. Now, a second benefit is that it simply detects more failures, both electrical and mechanical failures with a very high accuracy. And detecting more failures is highly useful, obviously. Thirdly, it really sets the stage for a more, uh, for digital transformation in, in heavy industry with all of that information about performance and about energy consumption uh, from the, the backbone really of most production processes, the industrial electric motors, driving pumps, compressors, conveyors, and more. And right off the bat, that makes ASA a truly unique solution. And just as an example of how this is being used on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, one of our clients is, is ArcelorMittal, the steel industry, and they wanted to monitor a hot strip mill, which is a conveyor system that moves sizzling hot plates of steel from A to B across the production line. Now, in those very high temperatures, it is impossible to install traditional sensors because they have to be installed on the asset in the field where they are exposed to these extreme temperatures. So the fact that we can install inside the motor control cabinet to monitor the hot strip mill literally hundreds of meters away is useful. What's also useful there is that the conveyor tends to fail due to either electrical or mechanical failures. And with a single system, you can detect both, raising the availability of the hot strip mill in the process. And thirdly, additional information about performance and energy consumption allows them to optimize uh, the performance of the hot strip mill itself. 
all of this based on SAM4, the uh, condition monitoring system that we provide. Now, if you're interested in learning more, please do reach out. We have pilot projects available where we typically uh, monitor 25 or more units. And a good rule of thumb is that a, a budget of around 40 uh, to 50K in US dollars is a good place to start. And we fully expect you uh, that you will recover that in a matter of months. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Gijs Klaassen um, from the Netherlands, from uh, Schouten Europe, responsible as an international sales manager. Um, and I'm here to tell you a bit more about the protein transition. Um, let me start with a small introduction about us as a company. Um, we're a Dutch family business, started over 130 years ago with the, with the bakery. Um, we are still a, a Dutch family business, by the way, but in the meanwhile, um, yeah, we transformed into uh, something else, uh, meaning a pioneer and innovator in plant-based uh, protein products. Um, and in the meanwhile, we uh, were quite busy with feed optimization. So we have a very strong background in uh, trading in ingredients, uh, feed yeah, optimization, uh, specialism in uh, plant-based proteins. Of course, in a further, in a in an earlier stage, uh, using those proteins to feed animals, uh, and then yeah. Afterwards, we consumed those animals, but since 1990 already, we started uh, with Schouten Europe as it is today, uh, and that's 100% focused on plant-based only products. So that gives us over 30 years experience with um, plant-based alternatives. Uh, at the moment, we're active globally in over 50 countries for um, yeah, retail, out of home, and uh, food industry, so meal components or meal ingredients. Um, our vision is uh, quite clear, so we're convinced that the world requires uh, uh, yeah, a food uh, that's more yeah, plant-oriented plant than uh, animal-oriented, uh, also to be part of the uh, emission problem we have uh, globally. How do we do that? Um, yeah, phase one for us was feed optimization, so making sure uh, the animals were consuming the right type uh, of, of uh, protein, of course. So uh, the family business was really focused on uh, that part of the business. So all about optimizing uh, animal proteins. The second phase for us was uh, replacing meat. So we started with that in uh, 1990. Um, yeah, making sure uh, that we mimic meat as much as possible. So uh, yeah, this phase is still very much ongoing, but this phase is all about replacing animal um, protein with uh, a plant-based uh, uh, protein alternative like a burger, mince, sausage, uh, a nugget, a snack, so all types of, uh, let's say, classic mimic meat replacers. The next phase uh, in our eyes is uh, less processing. So at the moment, uh, when you look at the, the, the meat replacers, they are um, very uh, um, processed, so we have to make them look and exactly tastes like uh, like the real uh, meat that takes a lot of energy and it consumes different type of ingredients, of course. And we think that the second phase is all about less processing, using more and more local ingredients, uh, as you can see in phase four, but also other ingredients that make it, uh, make them more interesting. Um, yeah, we know that uh, approximately one third of uh, the daily uh, diet uh, is provided with with protein. And we also know that if we um, use that one third of plant-based protein instead of animal protein, we would need 25% less land um, to, uh, uh, to stock animals. How do we like to do that? Um, yeah, our company portfolio at the moment is over 150 products um, with a real clear split in meat replacements and um, scout variations as we call them. And that's less processed, and we use all kind of different uh, protein sources uh, for that, as you can see on the right hand uh, side. So, so is the main used one, but after that, <coughs> you see numerous uh, and different uh, types of uh, protein sources as well. That's what I would like to tell you uh, about our company as a short introduction.
Hello, my name is Philippe Leduc. I am the technology lead for Sioux Technologies, and I am pleased to give you a presentation today of our surgery planning and navigation system technology. Sioux Technology is a Dutch high-tech service and solution provider, um, providing solution in UX software, massware, photonics, and mechatronics for the medical and semiconductor equipment industry. We have more than 25 years of experience in high-tech development with R&D center in all over the world, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, China, Singapore, and Vietnam. Our annual turnover exceeds $100 million USD, and uh, the number of employees actually, uh, actually uh, exceed 850 engineers nowadays. So we started our journey in AI-powered medical imaging three years ago, when we realized, working with clinicians, that despite the fact of the top-end medical imaging technologies are nowadays available, a lot of work is still required to obtain efficient 3D representation usable for diagnosis, surgery planning, and surgery navigation. For instance, here are 2D actual views of a brain with hematoma from different sources, CT, CTA, and MRI. How to easily identify the hematoma, accurately size and locate it within the brain, and determine the best solution to remove it. It is very difficult in practice for clinicians to combine different image sources, especially since the software solutions and the related algorithm from existing medical imaging companies are often proprietary closed systems, which are only usable with their equipment. We concluded that for every surgery, uh, we need a tailored solution and that no such solution is currently available for preoperative and uh, intraoperative navigation. And from there, we developed a unique technology to address this need. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Adeline Hong, our project manager in charge of the development of this technology, who will give you a tour today. Thank you, Philip. So here we're presenting you the state-of-art medical software empowered by AI algorithms to assist the clinician in clinical diagnosis, surgery planning, and navigation. So with this technology, this clinician can uh, combine uh, medical images from multiple sources. Uh, that means including multiple modalities, for example, CT, CTA, MR, and MRI, and also from different manufacturers into one combined 3D volume for easier interpretation. And um, with the assistance from AI algorithms, uh, the the, the technology can help the clinician separate out cr critical anatomical structures like vessels, um, nerves, and tumor from the medical image to help the surgical planning. So in the planning phase, uh, with the 3D reconstructed uh, volume, uh, the surgeon can uh, take measurements, uh, manipulate the 3D volume, and also uh, plan and optimize the path of the surgical tools uh, to make sure that it doesn't hit or damage any of the critical structures in the patient. And then during the uh, surgery, uh, with integration of this technology and other positioning and tracking devices, uh, this uh, solution can really provide real-time positioning information of the medical uh, tools uh, to the clinician to help um, guide the, the positioning and moving of the, of the medical tools. So here I would like to show you a demonstration of, of how we uh, use this technology in the removal of hematoma. So what you can see on screen is a 3D volume combined from CT, CTA, and MRI. So you can see the skull from the CT image. And then here marked in green is the nerve from the uh, MRI image. And then also the vessels uh, segmented from the uh, CTA image. And also with uh, the support of AI algorithms, the condition can really outline the target tumor to remove. And also what you can see in this screen is the trajectory path of the needle uh, shown here in the dashed line. So this is how we use this tool to really help the clinician uh, visualize the 3D volume from different angles and to make sure um, nothing gets damaged when doing the surgery. So I think with this example, you can see how this technology really uh, support the clinician by providing them comprehensive medical information uh, in a very uh, easy to interpret uh, format 
and then also uh, support them in saving time and also boosting their confidence before going into the surgery. And removal of hematoma is just one of the medical applications that this technology can support. Uh, we're, uh, we're confident that this technology can also assist in other uh, medical operations like um, spine surgeries, cancer treatment, and radiotherapy. So we're actively looking for more collaboration opportunities with doctors, hospitals, medical OEMs, and also specialized research centers who would like to uh, further explore uh, different applications of this technology and move it forward. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, if you're interested in our technology, please join us in our online booth. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Merlinex. I'm the founder of Steel Trace. On Steel Trace, we do the digital traceability from the supply chain of steel for the chemical and petrochemical in industry. We're a Dutch company. We were founded in 2017 with a mission to bring transparency to the supply chain of steel. We use new technologies like platforms and blockchain to seamlessly integrate the quality management uh, of steel throughout the whole supply chain. One of the problems is that the current quality assurance of the supply chain steel is a lot of manual work. You have to be physically there. All the data is captured in a non-structured way. So there is always a person that has to check it. Um, and it's very difficult to look at historical uh, data. So here you see an example of uh, how a supplier provides data to an end user. And you see the red markings and that's all manually checked by the end user. Uh, it's prone to your human error. Uh, it can be uh, easily changed, modified to document, or just uh, completely fake. It's a time-consuming process and that is very expensive. And in the end, you don't have the possibility to very easily uh, retrieve historical data and do analysis on it. So here is an example. This is of a welded tube, starts with a plate mill, Plate mill creates a steel plate, starts adding data like tensile test, impact test, yield strength, and that then goes to the pipe mill, and the pipe mill has to verify that it complies with their specification. Then they turn that into a pipe. They work maybe with an external laboratory. Maybe there's an inspector there that needs to endorse the, uh, the data. Um, and that all happens with PDF documents going around, emailing, printing, signing, stamping, scanning, etc. And with steel trace, we're sort of the LinkedIn for the steel industry. So every company uh, gets an interface and can all and can add their part of the data and take digital responsibility with a digital signature. And when the data moves through the supply chain, we automatically verify uh, the data against the customer specifications. So there's no more need for manual review. We also store every step that everybody takes in the supply chain, meaning that. Uh, there's full traceability. Now every company has a silo and uh, keeps their own administration to prove traceability. When they are all working in seal trace, this is fully automated and just part of the normal process. We call this compliance by design. We pre-program in the rules with which a, which a product has to comply and a company has to work with. And within those rules, they move uh, the, product, the data moves through the supply chain and it cannot move further unless it complies with the predefined rules. Um, the protection against fake, right now uh, you can theoretically buy a good pipe from a good mill, have a PDF certificate, and then you buy 20 pipes from a bad mill, you copy over the marking and you just copy the certificate. The steel tray certificates are transferred in ownership and not copyable, they're unique. And there is a quantity attached to it and can only be created by that spe specific manufacturer. Nobody else can create certificates in their name. And this is uh, how you cannot add new products in the supply chain uh, that didn't come from the original manufacturer. So whenever somebody tries to sell you a pipe as an end owner, you just have to ask, can you also prove that you're the owner of the digital counterpart of that pipe? Just like you prove that you're the owner of a Bitcoin. It also impacts the carbon footprint because it makes it easier to do life extension studies, so easier to keep things longer in process and uh, having to renew less products. There's a reduction of incidents. It's completely paperless, so no more sea containers full of paper. 
uh, and um, you can reduce the product returns, which uh, reduce the need for transport. It's easier to recycle products uh, and there's less delays in the supply chain and you can plan more securely so you don't have wasted uh, boats running or trucks driving, etc. Another goal that we have is to capture the carbon footprint of each company in the supply chain that worked on the product and then provide a pointing system to, uh, to the end owner with which it can determine uh, the carbon footprint and which pipe they should buy uh, to have the lowest carbon footprint in their, uh, in their operations. Uh, we are still looking for partners on this subject to uh, for <clears throat> independent uh, uh, objective quantifiable uh, quantifying system. Uh, there are other people working on it and can probably do that better than we can. Um, and once those uh, standards have been established, we will add this to the platform. Here are some of the companies that we work with. As you can see already two major end owners are on board and there's a couple more coming. So this is really scaling up in the market right now. Um, a product is at a phase where it's ready to use. So you can implement it today. And uh, what we are looking for is uh, yeah, either if you're a customer, if you're a manufacturer of steel, if you're a stockist of steel, or if you're an EPC or an end owner, contact us and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll set something up. Um, or if you're in a carbon footprint space um, and you are working on a quantifying system for uh, capturing the carbon footprint of, uh, of a company, you're also very interested in, in working with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Niels Posma and I'm the founder of the Dutch tech startup Tap Online. We create smart paper and we focus on the data that our paper provides. Our first product that we have created is called TempSense. And I would like to thank Tech Innovation for giving us the opportunity to tell you something about our product. Every year, there are 10 billion kilos of refrigerated products imported through worldwide cold supply chains. You can think of medicines, food, but also, for example, COVID vaccines. About 10% of that amount is thrown away because something went wrong during that transport. That's 1 billion kilos of loss. That is more than the heaviest container ship in the world. These numbers are just for the Netherlands. Imagine what those numbers are globally. The problem is that it is unknown where these damages originated. And that means that there are a lot of difficulties in holding somebody accountable. But even more important, how to prevent it from happening in the future. We create 100% recyclable smart paper that measures, remembers, and presents temperature data to anyone with a smartphone without having to download apps or to use hardware. So it basically is a data logger made of paper. We call it TempSense. We use agricultural waste as a basis for our paper and integrate printed electronics. The technology is comparable in size to a staple and therefore it falls within the normal waste paper recycling process. No plastics, metals or other hazardous materials are being used. Imagine that 1 billion plastic data loggers are being disposed of. They all add to the massive amounts of e-waste. In addition, the data from our paper is accessible to everyone with a smartphone. You don't need to download any app, just hold your smartphone next to the paper label and it will unlock the data immediately. We build progressive web apps that can embed all sorts of additional information. You can share storage advice, prescriptions or manuals. It's all possible and even fully automated through APIs. And the same goes for the paper itself. It's fully customizable. So extend your message and brand the labels in any way that you would wish. Also, our paper is smart. Our smart paper is much cheaper than traditional data loggers. So it's not only better for the planet, it's also better for your budgets. And last but not least, data is not only accessible by users, but also by senders. They have access to our cloud platform where everything comes together. Have insights to time, place, devices, and temperature data. 
filter by routes, users, or destinations easily, and send your data directly into your own systems. At the moment, our paper is already being used all over the world on a daily basis, from Netherlands to Australia. Clients are able, are able to check data worldwide through dashboards in our cloud platform. E-waste is one of the biggest problems of the upcoming decades, and we want to use our paper to reduce the usage of traditional plastic data lockers and create better insights in supply chains. We are looking for companies to join us in this mission. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. My name is Marika from the Netherlands. I am the CEO of the company that's called The New Fork. We're based in Amsterdam at the Science Park. And we're here to tell you about Open Food Chain. Open Food Chain is everything about food and we are establishing the tech powered future of our food. The problem that we're focused on is this problem. On one hand, we all know as consumers, we get confused. We get confused when we are in the supermarket, but we also get confused when we buy our goods and services online. We have no idea what the ingredients are. We have very little idea of the way it is produced, where it comes from, and for example, how sustainable the product is that I'm buying and consuming. Now, that's the consumer side. On the business side, we actually have a problem that we often feel um, as a big heap of paper. So the more complex supply chains, the more paper we get in our supply chains. If we put that in a, a more sort of easy to understand picture, this is the picture that we have in food, in many other industries as well, but definitely in food. Very disconnected, very um, siloed supply chains uh, and data centers. Now, what Open Food is doing, we are connecting the databases that we have in the supply chain. So we make it easy for data to communicate and we make it easy for product passports to establish. So every player in a supply chain can add information to the, the product passport. We have an example here, and this is uh, in the juice industry. If you scan the QR code with your phone, you enter the code. So you enter the best before date, which you see on the slide, and a unique uh, identifier, you see exactly where that juice is coming from, which companies have been dealing with that juice and under what conditions that juice has been produced and actually uh, yeah, made available to you. We do this not only in juice, um, the reference uh, to the juice example is uh, juicychain.org. It's uh, an organization uh, that actually unites the whole food and uh, sorry, the juice industry. Um, check it out, it's very valuable to look at. But we're also implementing this in fish, where we have uh, fish, uh, shrimps actually, from Vietnam that are being exported to Europe. And we track and trace the labor conditions. Next to fish, we have soy. Um, also, we have a link here to Asia, where um, this is all about the, the US grown soy that is going to um, the Thai uh, consumer market. So as you see below, we have bigger companies with whom we work, but we also like to have smaller companies because we are very sort of inclusive. If you look at the solution that we call Open Food Chain, there is three things that are different if you compare it to any other digital tool. First of all, it's highly interoperable. So if you use other tools, it super communicates with these tools. So you don't need to explain or uh, replace existing tools. Um, it gives huge cost savings in terms of supply chain management, but also definitely on food safety, food quality and other traits on what we call the compliance process. And thirdly, but definitely important, it is industry owned. Um, what is very unique to us, we developed this open source. Um, and in the case of Juice, the Juicy Chain Org owns um, the solution that we develop. Now, if you compare it to the arena where there's often uh, uh, made reference to V chain, Covantes or the Mudo, which are uh, also blockchain solutions for supply chains, we have uh, distinctive qualities on these four uh, characteristics that you see on the left. So the mentioned interoperability is very farmer friendly. 
uh, we have a very predictable cost structure and it's highly scalable. Now, we have one call to action to you. Um, we actually like you to uh, consider and look at our uh, the, the supply chain solution, Open Food Chain. And you can either invest or you can onboard. And onboarding means starting to use it in your supply chain. And ideally, you combine the two. Now, uh, that the, the investment part is um, it's everything about a token sale that we're preparing that will go live in the next couple of two weeks, where uh, you can invest in open food chain. And ideally, you combine it with onboarding your own supply chain on open food chain. So transparency becomes something that is commonplace rather than the, uh, the exception. Um, so my name is Marika. You can contact me at the number below. I'm very available on WhatsApp or email, or you can have a look at our website. Hope to see you there and keen to hear more and get more feedback from you. Good day. My name is Wim de Laat, and I will talk about protein production by fermentation on behalf of the Protein Brewery. Protein Brewery is a small startup with, that's developing uh, new protein products based on fermentation. As a, a very experienced uh, founding team and a uh, big Series A investment, last year we closed the 26 million euro investment um, and by Nova Holdings, Roquette and Unovis. Now, the purpose of our company is to change the way we produce proteins because Five years ago, we saw that we import a lot of soybean in the Netherlands, feed that to animals in an awful animal unfriendly way and ship meat all around the world. And this is not a very sustainable way of producing proteins. So we thought, can we build a business case out of producing proteins by fermentation? Uh, in order to do that, we developed a product development strategy. Uh, meeting all the food trends, being non-allergic, more protein, more fiber, and less carbohydrates, uh, but also addressing uh, very important social and, and environmental issues that we are dealing with as a, as a society. And that is that we have to produce more proteins to, to feed build 10 billion people, so it should be scalable in order to have impact. It should be affordable. If it's not affordable, people cannot buy and it will not grow. It should be acceptable, sustainable, nutritious, and healthy safe and delicious. And if we tick all those boxes, we will uh, be able to sell uh, alternative proteins uh, to the food market. Well, Fermotin is the first product that we are going to commercialize. This is a fermentation-based product uh, based on a selection of sustainable feedstocks that are non-allergic, high yield per hectare, high water efficiency, global rollout. The brewery will produce more protein per hectare than with soybean, even three to four times more protein than with the best protein crop. We have two versions, a wet product to be able to be applied in meat analogs and a dried version that can be applied as a food ingredient in bread, fortified food, etc. So it's very rich in protein, very ess high essential amino acid contents, low in carbohydrate and affordable. Um, the raw materials that we are going to use is sugar beet and um, uh, in the northern hemisphere, corn and potato around the world. And in Asia and in Africa, we can use cassava and sugarcane as a raw material to produce vermotin locally. Where is the company now? We have a pilot plant and food experience center started up and the first food products have now been developed. So we are now building customer relations and uh, developing um, uh, letters of intent to, to build our demo plant. Uh, our business model is that we will uh, provide ingredients, business to business, cheaper than meat and plant-based and local for local produced. So uh, we are now getting a regulatory approval in Europe, to use ourselves from the grass so we can sell in the US. And we want to have six full-scale operating plants around the world by 2030. And with that, I thank you for your attention.